Good morning, and welcome to the Wednesday, April 21st, 2010 edition of Inquisition Update with Tom Fress. My name's Tom Fress, your host. You're listening to LibertyRadioLive.com. It's a beautiful morning here in central Iowa. And uh, welcome to my guests uh, and my listeners. My guest this morning is returning to help us explore further what we are learning in the book, The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives. This book came highly recommended by my my guest, uh, John Daniel, to help us understand the colonial period and the dynamics that took place in the formation of the Maryland colony, Roman Catholic colony in the United States, and all of this to help us understand how the United States performs its prophetic role in the world according to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, as the second beast that causes the whole world to worship the first beast. We've covered two preparatory sections of this book, uh, the first being the preparation and the second being the planting. And now we're into the third section of this book, the harvest. And even the titles of these three sections indicate a plan, a well-concerted plan for the establishment of Catholicism in these normally regarded Protestant colonies, and eventually the seating of our government. And my, my guest this morning, John Daniel, the author of the book, the, 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 Grand, the Grand Design, is here to help us understand what we're learning in this book. Good morning, John. Good morning, uh, Tom. I, again, thank you so very, very much. I'm very humble and uh, grateful uh, to be invited on your show, and uh, I pray that your listeners <clears throat> will understand these things as the truths that they really are. Well, we're happy to have you with us and help us understand uh, how we got from this Maryland colony early in the founding of our country to a Jesuit Vatican-led government. And I'm sure you, being most qualified among among the researchers having to do with colonial times and uh, British history, can help us uh, comprehend this book. Thanks for coming on. I uh, <clears throat> I just want to say this um, um, that uh, yeah, you know anyone that is honest enough to really want to know what the truth is. Um, the books like The Ark and the Dove, and there are other books also that are written by Roman Catholic authors that leave you absolutely without a shadow of a doubt what was going on. And, um, I, I, you know, I have used this um, concept or um, example before when you go into a church and the the plate is passed around uh, for foreign missions and uh, in other words you you donate an offering and uh, that offering is being used to pay for missionaries that are going from the church that you are giving this donation to from that particular land to the far mission to wherever this land is that they want to uh, convert, proselyte, or in other words, to persuade, or in some cases even to uh, use force to get another person or a group of people to believe the same way that you believe. And that's the whole purpose of this thing. And my point is that 
when England separated herself from Rome, it infuriated her. And every effort, every effort was made to bring England back into the fold of Rome. And there was an incredible, terrible struggle that was going on. And England became a mission. And so the missionaries that were sent there were the Jesuits. And many of the uh, wealthy people, the elite of England, where they could not um, do what they wanted to do in that country firsthand, they literally went over to Europe in the main, on the main lane, mainland and uh, became students of the Jesuits, a training that, that may pre prepare them for the work of being missionaries to go back into England and do the work that they were educated to do. And so all of this was going on, and what I'm trying to establish here is that England literally became a mission for the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits to bring England back into the fold of Rome. And it just so happened at that particular time that England was colonizing the New World. And so when the beachhead was established in England as a mission by the Jesuits, then America itself, or I should say, the American colonies, the English American colonies themselves became a mission. And this mission was supervised by the mission that was established in England. Right. And so all of this back history, you know, it might seem very dull to most people, and it's over their heads perhaps, in many cases, because they've never been taught these things. But I'll tell you what, those who criticize even Liberty Radio Live, and this fellow by the name of Tom Perez, who's reading the Arkandove, it only proves to show just how great this deception is that was pulled off. And one thing for sure, when you hear people talk about, and they begin to grasp that something is really going on, oh, our American government or America has been infiltrated, invaded, we well, see that in itself, again, proves just how great this deception is. Because the simple fact is, America has never been infiltrated, it has never been invaded as far as the American government is concerned, that's what I'm referring to, because the American government itself was, was produced by those people on a, on a very well-planned uh, secret mission to accomplish just what they accomplished. And one of the things that I want to bear out here as an introduction as we get into this little presentation here this morning is the simple fact that once the victory was accomplished, you will find that the celebration took place at the estate of Charles Curl. And you will also find that the French army, who was responsible, so-called, of defeating the British army, and uh, they celebrated in Baltimore on the very site that John Carroll had begun to lay the foundation for the first cathedral in the colonies 
And they said a high mass right there as a celebration event. And when John Curl in 1789, uh, the very year that the United States of American government became a nation, John Curl went to England and had his head anointed in celebration, a victory celebration, as the first bishop of the hierarchy, the first in the colonies that was that was established through the work that they did to bring about the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church in the Protestant, English, New World, what we know as the United States of American government. Why did he go to England? Well, because this was where the mission was originally. And uh, why were the, who was the celebrants? I mean, who was there to celebrate? Well, you find that they celebrated in what was known as the Lulworth Castle. And there was also those wealthy, super, super wealthy Roman Catholics that were there to participate in the celebration of the Waldorf Castle. And, you know, I, I, I make this statement that I'm originally from the state of Maryland. That's where I was born and raised, around the Baltimore area. So I know this area very well. And I tell you by experience, you know, the Carroll family is very well known even to the point where hey, there's a Carroll County in Maryland. You know, on Cathedral Street in Baltimore sits the first cathedral that was established by John Carroll. And this is where the French soldiers held their mass after the victory of defeating the English Army. Uh, and... Uh, well, or John England, certainly put it that way, uh, right there in that whole area that I was born and raised in. So, all of this history is very uh, vivid in my mind as I have done my research and uh, share. And I, I just, I, you know, it just, uh, it's just a passion of mine, I suppose, to want to share this truth so that people can understand what is really going on in our country today because we are exactly at the almost the beginning of the end of what this country was literally founded for. And, of course, it all fits in with our American Great Seal uh, that you see on the back of your $1 bill. Yeah. And this is all part of it. I can't understand how anybody can... Uh, read these books or understand this history if they really want to know the truth and not come to the same conclusion that's being brought out in this book. Yeah. And John, you were talking books. about John, you were talking about this celebration uh that was had in Baltimore and in and Britain uh, over this and uh, how how well certainly I just want to say that that certainly the history of the Carroll family and the Maryland colony was important to the Pope because he gave a, a, a copy of an autobiography of John Carroll to President George W. Bush uh, prior to the Pope's visit to this country. And, and it was all about the Maryland colony and the, and the Carroll family. And, and the information that you bring to bear is their involvement in the formation of our government, the Declaration of Independence, and some of the uh, the, the articles uh, uh, of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and our entire form of government. And uh, this is what's oftentimes missed uh, when researchers talk about the Revolutionary War. The Carroll family is completely ignored. And it's it's come to my attention that the Carroll family was so influential uh, that it's it's almost it's almost uh, untenable that these researchers don't know this and don't mention it. Yeah, I have to agree, and you have to realize that I don't think it's all just total ignorance. 
uh, Tom. I think yeah. it's intentionally ignored because nobody wants to expose what the Roman Catholic Church really was up to and actually accomplished. And uh, uh, this is a, <laughs> our, right now, as we, you know, I, we're privileged to be able to speak our mind on Liberty Radio Live. And I, I, I'll say this to folks that call me, and I, I want... I want folks to give the credit where credit is due uh, by the grace of God that this station that Nicholas has provided is, in my mind, it's a gift from God that to be able to uh, have folks like yourself, Tom, and Greg, and guests uh, that come on uh, the show to share these truths that people might be critical of, but the simple fact is any truth through any any age, when it comes to the truths of God, the true God, there's always been criticism, not just plain criticism, but if they if they have enough power to, to do it, they want to silence you, and they want to shut you up. Yeah. And so we struggle here on Liberty Radio Live, and other places where we have our ministry to provide these truths. And, uh, but by the grace of God, there are some dear hearts out there that, that want to understand these things. And, uh, they will do a little homework of their own, do their own research, and come to the exact same conclusions that we have come to ourselves as we've done our own research. Because it doesn't mean anything to anybody else when somebody else does all the homework for you and you put it there in your lap, in their lap. You've got to do your own homework, and then it becomes an experience to you where you know what the truth is, and nobody else then can deceive you anymore. Right. Right. That's so important. You have to own this information. It has to belong to you. You have to, you have to earn it. And uh, we're just hopeful that uh, the information we bring forth on LibertyRadioLive.com and, and uh, Inquisition Update encourages people to get involved and and uh, and uh, come to ne- come to these understandings on their own, to spend some quality time researching, and checking out some of the uh, the things we talk about here, because when they do, then they own it. You know, to give you the um, the great struggle. That uh, that was going on in England, even between the uh, the Jesuits themselves and uh, and uh, George Calvert or Cecil Calvert, I should say, which was the son of George Calvert, of uh, the Lord Baltimore. Um, it uh, there was a, a terrible struggle going on. And um, they, they, you know, you can read things um, to people, but uh, I want to I want to take and read a letter here to give you an idea of what was going on. And we brought this out a little bit in my last time I was on your show. But this particular letter is written by Cecil Calvert to his brother, who was the governor of Maryland. And Cecil Calvert was in England. Leonard Calvert, his brother, who was the governor of Maryland, was in Maryland. Cecil Calvert never stepped foot in the colony that he was the owner of uh, in Maryland. So, but his brother was there, and he had sent letters to him to counsel him what was going on in England, and his very, very life was being jeopardized by some of the actions of the Jesuits, and he wanted his brother to fully understand this, and he writes this letter. 
And this okay. is taken from um, letters of Cecil Calvert to Leonard Calvert, uh, written in November 21st to 23rd, 1642, and you find them in what is known as the Calvert Papers. He writes this, and I'm quoting. Okay. For whatsoever you may conceive of them, speaking of the Jesuits, who have no reason upon my knowledge to love them, very much if you knew as much as I do, concerning their speeches and actions here towards you. Now remember now, <clears throat> excuse me, Cecil is writing to his brother Leonard, who is the governor of Maryland. I am upon very good reasons, satisfied in my judgment that they do design my destruction and have no good cause to suspect that if they cannot take or cannot make or maintain a party among the English to bring their ends about, they will endeavor to do it by the Indians within a very short time by arming them against all those that shall oppose them. And all under presence of God's honor and the propagation of the Christian faith, which shall be the mask to hide their other designs with all. If all things, he goes on to say, if all things that clergymen should do upon these pretenses should be accounted just, and to proceed from God, laymen were the basest slaves and the most wretched creatures upon the earth. And if the greatest saint upon earth should intrude himself into my house against my will, and in despite and in despite of me, with the intention to save the souls of all my family, but withal give me just cause to suspect that he likewise designs my temporal destruction, or that being already in my house doth actually practice it, though withal he do perhaps many spiritual goods, yet certainly I may and ought to preserve, my, preserve myself by the expulsion of such an enemy, and providing others to perform the spiritual goods as he did, who shall not have any intention of mischief towards me. For the law of nature teaches this, that it is lawful for every man in his own just defense. Those that will be imprudent must be imprudently dealt with. That's pretty strong words. Well, I'm stymied, John, because we have Cecil Calvert, a Roman Catholic, concerning himself with the affairs of Maryland in Great Britain. His brother is the governor of Maryland in Great Britain, and he's writing a letter to his brother warning him about the Jesuits. This is very interesting information, and um, I want to continue with this when we get back from the break. I think I heard the cue there. Uh, you've been listening to Inquisition Update on LibertyRadioLive.com. My guest today is John Daniel, researcher in the colonial period, a researcher into the Jesuit order, a researcher into the Vatican, and their involvement in the, for in the formation of the Maryland colony and our federal government. And um, his explanation of this peculiar letter between uh, Cecil Calvert and his brother, I believe Leonard Calvert, uh, here in the Maryland colony, seemingly very, very suspicious, if not openly hostile to the Jesuits, which wouldn't be a surprise at all to me, knowing some of the history of the Jesuits. But what is the purpose of this fear? It seems to me that uh, the, the Jesuits uh, are a threat to the Maryland colony as it was established, being a land that uh, was free religiously and had no established church, and Protestants and Catholics ser uh, served uh, and worshipped uh, without interfering with one another. They basically lived in peace. What what is the what is the fear Cecil is expressing here? What I what I want to bring out 
Tom, in reading that letter. Okay. Is the book, The Ark and the Dove, as everything that the Roman Catholic Church is based on is lies and deceptions, and but it bears out the simple fact of what really was going on, very, very subdued, but it's all there. But what they don't tell is the incredible involvement of the Jesuits that actually put this whole thing together at the top. But basically, many of the Jesuits at the bottom of that pyramid didn't really understand what was going on. And what was going on in England, the incredible vicious, ferocious struggle that was going on. It was about to come to a climax, and it was threatening Cecil Calvert's uh, Maryland colony and every, the incredible investments that was put into that, and also even his own life. I, I, I have done something <clears throat> for this morning's presentation, and uh, if anybody out there that are, are listening uh, are interested in this want to talk to me about it, you certainly can give me a call, and with your permission, Tom, I'd like yes, to give please, my phone go number. Ahead, go ahead and give your phone number, John. My phone number is Erico 304 Three nine two six one five five. Again, area code three zero four three nine two six one five five. I took the time to write down the different um, names that that sat on the English throne, and I'm going to start with Mary who was the daughter of Henry VIII. And this Mary was known as Bloody Mary. And when you look up or this small uh, hand uh, encyclopedia, um, it tells you that Mary reigned for only five years, from 1553 to 1558. And within those five years, in her obsession to bring England back into the fold of Rome, she put to death in the most vicious way, most of it by burning alive, over 300 Protestants, uh, uh, predominant Protestants in in England in those five years, and the, the, the encyclopedia said it was unparalleled of any act of history in the history of, of England. By parallel, Queen Elizabeth reigned for 45 years. There was numerous assassination attempts on her life. Now, she was Protestant, right? And she's Protestant now. Right. Mary was Roman Catholic. And they were half-sisters, is that correct? And Elizabeth were half-sisters. Okay. Okay? In other words, by different mothers, all right. by the same father, which was Henry VIII. And she reigned for 45 years, and she began her reign when Mary, her sister, uh, died or passed away in 1558, and she reigned until 1603, and you will find that is 45 years. Okay. And in those 45 years, 
with the assassination attempts and the struggles that were going on, I think there was like three different popes that had excommunicated her in succession. In other words, she outlived three popes in succession almost, and uh, each one had excommunicated her to the point where it was enticing uh, the Roman Catholic in her realm that she was a target and uh, a, a prey that should be uh, uh, taken out. And that's exactly what, when you are excommunicated, is talking about. You're not yeah. fit to live, and you it is commendable if somebody wants to assassinate you or kill you and, and take you out. Right. In the same process, all of Europe, and I'm bringing this out to show the incredible struggle that was going on just to bring England back into the fold of Rome. Right. And anyone who don't think that England was a mission, then you don't understand the history of what was going on during these years. Yeah. All of Europe was in an uproar, and they contributed their, their funds financially to the most predominant ruling country of Europe at that time, and that was Spain. And they put together a navy called the Spanish Armada, it was over 130-some ships that went down that channel that had the full intention to invade England and forcibly bring her back into the fold of Rome. Yeah. But by the grace of God and the acts of God, well, that never materialized. It never became a reality. And these ships were actually forced to go around the, the northern part of the British Isles and go around to the west of the British Isles, and there they met their fate. A storm broke out and destroyed almost two-thirds of the ships and the sailors that were on them. And yes. Spain never recovered again with the military uh, sea power that she had at that time. So never. it was a massive Roman Catholic Spanish effort to forcefully seize Great Britain and bring her back under the papal throne, and God Absolutely. intervened by, by natural, by natural uh, means and destroyed that fleet to, and, and, and put Spain in the background again. And uh, so Protestantism, or at least uh, the reign of Queen Elizabeth, continued for a while then. When Elizabeth died in 1603... Then her relative, who was a cousin, who was the king of Scotland at that time, was James the Sixth of Scotland. Now Scotland was Catholic, I, right? Of England, and and Scotland was Catholic, right? And Scotland basically was Catholic. It was a yep. struggle going over on over there, um, the same as it was in England, but not quite as vicious. Not quite as vicious, but Scotland was a smaller country, and it didn't have the power and influence that England did. So the the focus was on England because once they got England back into the fold of Rome, everything else was going to follow suit. Right. And that's the way they felt about the colonies, also. You know. Right. So anyhow, James I lived and reigned from 1603 to 1625, which is 22 years. And anyone who knows the history of James I, he reigned as a Protestant, but he was very, very much a Roman Catholic sympathizer. And this is where George Calvert comes in the picture. He was the uh, Secretary of State uh, for James I. And he was totally directly influenced by the Jesuits. And it's it's... It's most interesting when you get into the pure history of what really went on there. And, uh, well, the Jesuits that were in England during those years after Queen Elizabeth, it's just, uh, well, it's quite amazing. Um, I can put my finger on it here. I uh, probably won't be able to. Um, but what I want to say is that um, 
there were there were several hundred Jesuits in England at that time, even though it was absolutely against the law. When I say against the law, by Parliament, the royalty favored it. The royalty favored it. And King James I was seeking a wife for his own son, uh, and he went to Spain to find this wife. And the negotiations, neg uh, negotiations fell through, and his son found the woman that he really wanted to marry to begin with in France. And here again, this lady was so, so Catholic that she would not even come to his coronation when he became the King of England. And this is, this again is the struggle that was going on over there in England. Um, when, um, you, you will find that the years, and I want to just make this as simple as I possibly can. The surname or the last name of the uh, descendants of James and James himself was known as Stuart. So whenever you hear about the Stuart family, you recognize that it's James I and all those descendants uh, that that came on the English throne through him. And it's very simple to remember. There was only James, which was the father, and the son, which was Charles I. And Charles I had two sons, which were grandsons to James I, which was Charles II and James II. And... The things that were going on, if you were to superimpose these dates in sequence and then put this, these dates on top of another set of dates where the Maryland colony was being set up and the, you got the Lord Baltimore's George Calvert and Cecil Calvert and then Charles Calvert, uh, all these and, and compare these dates with what was going on over there in England, then these things begin to, you can be, begin to relate to them, and these things become alive to you, in your mind and in your heart. But I'm going to tell you this, without a shadow of a doubt, there was an incredible struggle. When James I died, you find that Charles I came on. James, James I ruled for 22 years of his life. Charles I, the son, he came to the throne right after his father died in 1625, and he ruled to 1649. That's 24 years. Now, just stop and think it just for a few minutes here. You realize in those years, it was Charles I that George Calvert, he passed away right after James I had passed away. And Cecil Calvert became the owner, proprietor of the Maryland colony. And the, the, the work that his father, George Calvert, had done through all the work and the counseling to drafting. Uh, now, remember that George Calvert was the Secretary of State of Church, uh, for James I. And so he had this ability to, to set up and write charters. And he did this, and he had Jesuits right there counseling him uh, during the, the very time that, that all this was taking place now under Charles I. And Charles I, if you can picture in your mind the history of what was going on there, Charles I began to bulldoze and to bring in certain influences of the Jesuits that got to a point where a boiling point, to a point where it came to a head, and it created what was known in the in the English history as the the worst civil war that ever ever um, took place in England. And he ruled for 24 years, from 1625 to 1649. And you must remember 
that the Ark and the Dove, the book that you're reading from, Tom, the, the departure from England was in 1633, where they slipped around to the Island of Wight and picked up three Jesuits as passengers. That was against the law of the Parliament. The royalty was very much a part of this. But he was a parliamentarian that was Protestant that opposed these things. And they sailed on to establish the colony of Maryland. And we find that Charles I was... The, 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 the situations became so critical in England that this civil war erupted. And Oliver Cromwell, who was a commander of a military forces of his own, rose up against Charles I, who had his military forces, and Charles I lost to Oliver Cromwell. Now let's let's make sure our listeners understand. This was a religious civil war, primarily pitted between Protestantism and Catholicism. Is that correct? Cromwell that is exactly was, correct. Cromwell represented the Protestant militia. And uh, Charles I uh, was uh, was fighting for Rome. Is that correct? That is that is correct. That is exactly correct. And that's the incredible struggle that was going on. That was so viciously taken place at the very at the very time. Oh, excuse me a minute. And this was taking place at the time that the Jesuits organized this this ship. The Ark and the Dove. This was the very time that Cecil Calvert was writing his letter to his brother over there in Maryland because he seen everything. He was not just seeing it. He was experiencing everything that was going on. And he realized that he was going to lose his colony if he, wasn't, if he didn't walk the line. And he was going to lose his life. He was going to end up just like the king himself if he wasn't careful. But the Jesuits had no regard for Cecil Calvert or anyone else, as, he, as Cecil Calvert put in this letter. He had, they had no regard for anyone else but to ramrod what they wanted to ramrod through, and that was to establish wholeheartedly a, a Catholic Maryland colony. But the simple fact is, you see, at the top of the hierarchy, and including the Jesuit general himself, because it took a letter, it took a letter from Cecil Calvert as Lord Baltimore, second Lord Baltimore, to the Jesuit general to get the Jesuits in Maryland to back down. And that's a history that you're not getting in the book, The Ark and the Dove, because so it's let... all been suppressed. They want for the readers to read that book that this is, everything is very beautiful, smooth, everything okay. was okay. going along what, fine. What the, Ark and the, what the Ark and the Dove is not telling us is what you're telling us, that the Jesuits fomented uh, the, the worst civil war in British history. Catholicism's last attempt to take, well, not the last, but at least one, the current attempt to take over the British colony, the Protestant, the, the Protestant British uh, government fomented this civil war, and that they were the Jesuits who have been largely ignored so far in this book, The Ark and the Dove and the Maryland Colony, were just as rabid as as those Jesuits in Britain, and that they were, uh, uh, which is never mentioned in this book, that the Jesuits were trying to uh, overthrow uh, the the Calvert's control of Maryland to make Maryland a strictly Catholic colony. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying, Tom. That's exactly wow. what I'm saying. Wow. And they didn't care who they hurt in the process. All they wanted so, to so, do was so it becomes God. So it becomes very much more understandable to me why Cecil Carroll wrote, or Cecil Calvert was writing this cautionary letter to Leonard about the Jesuits and about how the Jesuits would, if they had to, use the Indians to help overthrow the, the Calvert government in Maryland. 
And that the purpose of that could only be to establish a church, a Catholic church, in Maryland and to do away with religious liberty in Maryland. Very quickly now, I just want to bring this thing to a conclusion. Okay. You find that Oliver Cromwell, Charles I was beheaded as a traitor to England in 1649. From 1649 to 1653, Oliver Cromwell was busy putting down uprisings both in Ireland, Catholic uprisings, and also in Scotland. From 1649 to 1653, that's what he was busy doing. In 1653, Parliament made him the protector of the Commonwealth. And he only lived after that from 1653 to 1658 for five years. Would it, would it be fair? Would it be fair to would it be fair to say that Cromwell was not only just the protector of the Commonwealth, but he was protector of Protestantism, right? That's exactly right. Well, basically, that's they both were one and the same as far as uh, the par the Parliament was concerned. The majority of the Parliament, let's put it that way. Right. Um, when Charles One was beheaded, his his devout devout um, Roman Catholic queen fled to France, taking the two children with him, with her. And when Crom Cromwell passed away, then Parliament, or the royalty party in the Parliament, chose to bring the two sons back into England. And that's where they did. They came back, and Charles I was put on the throne. I mean, Charles II, I'm sorry. Charles II was put on the throne in 1660. He towed, he towed the line. In other words, he, he walked the line for 25 years, and he died a natural death. And uh, this man is very controversial when you read the history of him. What do you mean? When he, he died, the James line? II came on the throne very quickly now. Okay. James II lived and ruled from 1685 to 1688, only three years. He started the same thing that his father did. He started ramrodding in such a manner, it was just absolutely unbelievable the things he did. And uh, they they'd almost had a second civil war. And he literally fled for his life because he didn't want to end up like his father. He fled back to France. In three years, that's the only three years that he ruled and reigned. And in 1688, it was called the Glorious Revolution because... The daughter of of Charles Charles II married the William of Orange, uh, which was a Dutch, and she was raised Protestant for some reason or somehow. She became Protestant and, and married William of Orange, and the Parliament invited her and her husband to come over and sit on the throne, in which they did in 1688. And England had declared herself to be Protestant, and she remained. And my point is that she had. Rome had to change her tactics. Instead of using force, they had decided, hey, we got to do what we can't do by force, we got to do by deception. And, and so all this was all put into practice, and uh, the rest is history of where it all went with uh, the Maryland colony, and uh, from there to separating the colonies from England and establishing the United States of American government. And the United States of American government from the very day of its inception was Roman Catholic under the Jesuits. Very, very interesting. Thanks, John, for coming on. We'll see you tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Thank you very much for having me on.